Ladies and gentlemen, it is my uh, great pleasure to welcome you uh, on behalf of Concordia University to the second uh, edition of the Consolidated Bathurst Lecture Series. Uh, Mesdames et Messieurs, j'ai un immense plaisir personnel uh, au nom de l'Université Concordia de vous souhaiter la bienvenue à cette euh, deuxième dans la série de conférences par année par euh, Consolidated Bathurst. It's uh, appropriate for me uh, as well at this moment to thank once again Consolidated Bathurst for their generosity to the university and for their foresight in instituting this lecture series. I want not only to thank the company, but particularly to thank its chairman and chief executive officer, William Turner, who has been so instrumental in promoting this idea and has shown such a personal interest in its success uh, since the series was inaugurated. The idea of establishing a series of lectures which involves the presence of an important thinker, and I use that term in its noblest sense, at Concordia University for a few days during the fall term, uh, this idea uh, that Consolidated Bathurst put forward in offering to fund this lecture series demonstrates a sensitivity to the intellectual needs of a university community, which is really uh, to their credit. They approved the cooperation, that cooperation between the private sector and the university uh, is not fraught with the perils that many academics used to believe it might. Uh, so it is with a great deal of pride and pleasure that I welcome you this evening and I ask uh, the chairman and chief executive officer of Consolidated Bathurst, Mr. William Turner, who's a true friend of Concordia even though in the last year he has assumed the role of Chancellor of Bishop's University, and we're proud to have him as well in that respect as a colleague and friend. He's indeed a friend of Concordia University. I'd like to welcome him and to invite him to come and introduce our distinguished lecturer, Mr. Turner. Mr. Chancellor and Mr. Rector, you know, I have to be careful about the Chancellor, so I <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Normally, when I'm in this hall, I'm sitting up on the, in the stands there watching one of your movies, because I'm one of the devotees of that series here and, uh, and use it as a, as a person who lives in Montreal. Uh, the rector referred to the reasons for the establishment of this lecture series, and they're, they're quite simple in, in a sense, because my company doesn't make things that sell to individuals directly. What we make is the newsprint that you find when you, when you buy your copy of your daily paper. And we make a lot of that, 4% of the world's newsprint. And so we're rather interested in what, what's said, and what's spoken, and what's thought. And uh, the whole educational framework, until the computer came along, really related to some of those, those discoveries of how to make printing presses work. Now the computers have enabled some of those things to be done electronically, and for that we're lucky. But, but it's that feeling that it's important. It's important that we demonstrate uh, an awareness of, of, of these kinds of things that cause us to form this lecture series. I think the other thing that's important in our minds is that here in a city, a major city like Montreal, blessed with two cultures, that sometimes we spend too much time, and I think this is a Canadian trait too, too much time worrying about ourselves and maybe not enough time outreaching. And this series is, is, is designed to bring distinguished scholars here, be they Canadian, be they foreign, to enrich our fabric. And the gentleman, Dr. Polani, whom we have with us today, uh, is a recognized person. The Nobel Prize stuff, and I'm sure, John, you've heard it ad nauseum, so I'm not going to go through it too much, except to say that, that uh, 
Alfred Nobel, when he had that idea, uh, got a momentum going that, uh, I mean, nothing that's done human is perfect, but on the other hand, the idea of recognizing the world's best is not a bad thought, even outside of the Olympics. And, uh, and uh, the Swedes, with that, and with that prize, have, have, have done something in a country that I would remind you is something about, in population, about a third of ours, and in, and in ge geography, perhaps a 20th. And so why shouldn't Canadians aspire to do things in those sorts of areas? And this is a very, very, very modest start on that sort of thing. Now, our speaker today is a scientist. Last year, we had a, a political observer in the newsprint newspaper field in James Reston. Uh, Dr. Polanyi is a leading, one of Canada's leading physical chemists and world-renowned authority on reaction dynamics, a new field in chemical physics. And for his work and discoveries in that field, he received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1986. Other honors and awards have been bestowed upon John Polanyi for his many contributions to scientific knowledge. Dr. Polanyi is a teacher and researcher the author of many articles and books, who joined the faculty of the University of Toronto's chemistry department in 1956 after establishing himself as one of Canada's preeminent scientific researchers at the National Research Council. He's also internationally known as a peace activist. His pioneering contributions to science have been matched by his deep concern for major public issues for more than 30 years. He has been an outspoken anti-nuclear activist and a forceful critic of the state of university research funding in Canada. In 1979, he co-edited The Dangers of Nuclear War. So that's his background. Please welcome with me one of Canada's distinguished Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Turner, for that uh, generous introduction, and uh, thank you also to Consolidated Bathurst, who is one of my hosts here, and uh, Concordia University, who's the other one, and, uh, and I thank all of you people who uh, can tolerate the thought of being lectured at for uh, around 45 minutes or something like that, but uh, if you wiggle around strenuously before 45 minutes are up, I'll take the hint. And, um, You've just been told that I'm a scientist, which is perfectly correct, and, uh, and I had the uh, happy good fortune to win that prize, but not for uh, speaking. And uh, so this is an amateurish effort on my part, and the, the subject, what's more, is a terribly difficult one. I chose it, so you don't have to feel sorry for me. Uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> but uh, it was really, the subject sort of thrust itself at me. It's, uh, something to do, I can't remember the exact wording of the title, but something to do with the responsibility of a scientist uh, and, uh, and some more subtitles, which I forget. And uh, the, uh, well, since I am a, and still, I mean, I was and remain a practicing scientist, I have a research group of about 14 uh, people, uh, some working for doctorates, some post-doctorates, one or two visiting scientists from abroad, and uh, a very busy laboratory, and that's how most of my time is spent. Uh, and in living my life, I have to have some uh, notion of what my responsibilities are, and I express that notion from in the way I live my life. Uh, to express it in words to you people is much more taxing, and uh, I have some notes, but very sensibly, they didn't put a bulb in the light here, so. Uh, I'll just speak extemporaneously. No, nothing. Um, there, there are more civilized places yet where they steal the lecturer's notes just to make <laughs> absolutely certain. Um, well, the, uh, there's two responsibilities that uh, come to mind and uh, obviously are pivotal. One is the responsibility that a person has uh, to his craft. In the case of a scientist, the responsibility to science. 
And that's very important. It's not, uh, I'm not going to stand here all of this 45 minutes uh, wringing my hands about the other aspect, which is the responsibility that a scientist has to society at large because he is a human being and he is a member of the community at large. So I'm going to divide my remarks up in that way and say something, first of all, about one's responsibility to one's field. Maybe I'll make a, a preface to both sections and say that in thinking about these questions of responsibility, uh, one should start, as everybody would if this were an academic occasion, by making a distinction between morals and ethics. And it's a worthwhile distinction. Morals are, are very broad, and uh, they say one should be humane, and uh, they uh, set up the, the high principles which we could all agree with. And then ethics uh, tackle the much more difficult question of translating those general principles of decency and honesty into actions. And so it's when you deal with ethics that you are involved in all the compromises that are just part of our human condition. They're inescapable. One of the compromises, in a way, is that uh, nobody knows... Well, we're faced with uh, problems, ethical problems, which, quite normally, have no solution. There is just uh, a way of trying to minimize uh, one's offense against the moral principles which one holds. So really, what we're struggling with in this room is going to be uh, ethics, not morals. Well, uh, the, uh, th there is actually one profession that has had a code, not a code of morals, but a code of ethics, actually. And you can guess what that is. It's the medical profession. And uh, through the Hippocratic Oath, uh, doctors uh, swear themselves and have done for over two millennia to uh, a pattern of behavior. And the Hi Hippocratic Oath, uh, uh, let me just see if I can make an extract from it here. It um, really is very broad. It only takes you a small step beyond the moral principles. It says that uh, a physician will not do anything to harm his patient. and. Uh, he undertakes then further, and now it's a little more close to ethics, he undertakes to give no deadly drug, even if the patient asks for it. And, you know, at first blush, that's all right, and then you think a little harder, and you wonder. <clears throat> and actually, the Hippocratic Oath goes on to say that the physician will not assist uh, a woman in procuring an abortion. And I mention that because, you know, there's, there's the gist of the oath, and... Uh, and you see how imperfect it is and how, with the passage of time, it uh, becomes dated. I mean, with the development of new technology, do we really believe that it's the physician's responsibility to prolong human life to the full extent that is possible? I don't uh, think so. But uh, anyway, uh, so ethical principles, uh, even when they have been uh, uh, poured over for 2,000 years, uh, create uh, very serious problems. And uh, I could enlarge on that a bit because I stumbled across uh, a journal called the Journal of Medical Ethics. And there, there was an article which was perfectly serious about a person who's standing in a bus line waiting for the bus and they see a uh, growth on the neck of the person in front of them which uh, they diagnose uh, as a malignant melanoma, which is a life-threatening condition, and the article was about what the physician should ethically do, and there, were, there was a list of seven things he should consider, not several, seven things he should consider, I mean, such as uh, how sure was he of his diagnosis, uh, uh, what would happen if this person didn't seek medical aid, how, did the person look like somebody who was going to seek medi medical aid anyway, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, it uh, all seemed... Uh, horrifyingly complex and, and likely to be interrupted after the sixth condition by the arrival of the bus before he'd reached the seventh one. Um, well, the story, I only tell it as a reminder that, uh, and that's why I refer to the Hippocratic Oath, there is nothing similar in my profession, which is uh, scientific research, 
And I would say there's nothing similar in the engineer's profession. The engineers sometimes mistakenly tell you they have such an oath, and when you look at it, you find it says that they will produce good workmanship, in essence. But that's not an ethical guide that is remotely sufficient for the uh, purposes I have in mind, because you could be doing something quite criminal and producing good workmanship. You could be constructing <laughs> a, uh, well, you've solved that conundrum yourselves. So even in professions where there have been uh, 2,000 years to develop uh, a guide to ethics, the guide is imperfect and constantly in need of examination, and we should expect the same. Um, I said I'd start with the responsibilities that a scientist has to the health of science, and uh, that's a, uh, a very congenial responsibility, um, but still, it bears thinking upon. A scientist obviously should care about science, otherwise he's a, a fraud. And uh, so that means that he should uh, embrace a commitment to truth and objectivity, so far as he it lies in him to, uh, to do that. And uh, I would add that he doesn't uh, need to be apologetic about his craft and, and shouldn't be apologetic because though we're going to go on to the, the problems that modern science has raised, which are of enormous importance, uh, let's first acknowledge that uh, the achievements of science uh, are one of the great glories, and in this century, the greatest glory, I would say, of our civilization. What I mean is that the insights that scientists have achieved into the motions of the planets and the architecture of the atomic nucleus are in every way on a par with the achievements of those who build different architectures, uh, people who build cathedrals or write the prose and the verse, which allows us to know ourselves in a different way. Uh, you could express it, if you liked, in the language that Albert Einstein, uh, an atheist, um, chose, and that was that uh, to know nature better, which is what science is about, is to enter a little more closely into the mind of God. Well, I said this is an obligation of scientists uh, and engineers, uh, but in truth, I've never known uh, scientists who didn't have that sort of commitment to their craft. Where scientists differ, and you may think it's part of another talk, I'm not so sure, is in their style, the way they approach their work. And uh, it's fascinating to watch their differences in style because those differences bear upon ethics. Uh, a scientist, after all, has to reconcile two opposing requirements, let's call them. His passion for the chase, for, for doing science and, and getting to the goal first, and his commitment, on the other hand, to dispassionate inquiry. The uh, <clears throat> former thing, this passion with which one does research, uh, acknowledges something very real, namely that science is performed by human beings. But the latter, this dispassionate uh, necessity for objectivity and therefore for dispassionateness, attempts to escape from the limitations of the personal. It's, of course, more important by far that uh, a discovery uh, shall be true than that it shall be made by some particular scientist. And yet, there wouldn't be any science without the intense personal commitment that causes an individual to uh, persist in his uh, scientific research, a very demanding pursuit, in the face of shattering disappointments. Most of the time, one fails miserably. And what we admire in discoverers, they don't have to be scientific discoverers, it could be Christopher Columbus or it could be Madame Curie, 
What we admire isn't really, when I main, mention those two names, it isn't the dispassionateness of uh, Columbus or Curry. It's uh, the commitment that, uh, to discovery and the faith that they showed in a distant outcome and the courage that flowed from that faith. Well, but to serve science is also to uh, serve the truth and science has to be protected from natural human tendency to slant observations, suppress uh, inconvenient data obtained on a bad day, or in the extreme, to fabricate evidence. And actually it goes further than that. Some scientists, uh, as you guess, uh, want to claim discoveries where in fact they shouldn't claim them. Others want to hide them um, because at first uh, announcement of a discovery, what happens isn't that people rush up and congratulate you. They, uh, they are skeptical and they are critical. And uh, so out of fear of uh, enunciating some extraordinary and eccentric thing that they found, scientists uh, can continue to say the conventional thing and, and damage science in the process. In fact, the story of Copernicus is a bit like that. He waited until he was on his deathbed to talk about the heliocentric, the sun-centered universe, and the best uh, accounts that I've seen on it, it wasn't because he was afraid of the church, but because he was afraid of other astronomers who would have laughed like mad if he'd said anything else. <coughs> well. There's another impulse to distorting science, to fabricating, and that's to please political masters. And even the milder manifestations of that uh, corruption damage science. And I won't bother with the obvious examples of uh, uh, Hitler's uh, Germany or Stalin's Russia or something of this sort, uh, but uh, even in Canada, one can think of uh, pressures uh, that are in a, in a way of that sort because, I mean, they're much milder, but we are under pressure to represent what is fundamental science, what is designed to try to improve understanding and then move on from there. We're under pressure to represent that as being relevant uh, to practical concerns, whether to uh, commerce or to health or defense and so on. And, uh, and there's great temptation to lie about that. I've done it myself. Um, I mean, not that it has to be a great temptation for me to give in, but anyway, it's, a, it's an adequate temptation. Well, and once you've made those links, especially if you make them spuriously, um, then governments uh, have a basis for asking you rightly to strengthen those links. And what happens, I don't want to dwell on it because it really falls within the domain of science policy, but I just want to show you that uh, our responsibilities to science, uh, our ethical responsibilities to science, bring us into the area of science policy. So I just want to say that if you make far-fetched claims for understanding the, the social good that will come from your branch of basic science, then governments start to institutionalize a selection procedure which is based on that spurious claim of yours. And, uh, the, uh, and fundamental science, which, uh, as I pointed out, has as its real purpose the making of discoveries, uh, and then later, the application of those discoveries once they've been made and let them be big discoveries so that the applications are big, uh, that becomes turned backwards and um, the, the sale of basic science through packaging starts to damage science. The, the government finds itself uh, encouraged by the scientist to support the package rather than the substance that's in the package. So we get huge programs uh, for the cure of cancer or the production of a death ray, naming, of course, the two uh, uh, edges of the scientific sword. 
And, uh, well, the best looking package is funded and the best science, which should have been funded, doesn't get done. Well, I uh, won't uh, go on to ideological uh, pressures. Uh, I don't know whether you feel they exist in our society. Probably they do, because science is part of the culture. But I'll leave it to you in discussion to say what you think on that topic. Um, what I'd rather do, because I want to keep my eye on the time and leave time for you to uh, pitch in. I see the, I, there are a couple of microphones here. I presume they're more than just decorative. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I think I'll, I should turn at this point to the other part of my talk, not the responsibility for people like me and many of you to uh, see that science is uh, objective and uh, science is uh, conducted on the basis of defensible guidelines, but our responsibility to society as human beings, citizens, and so on. And uh, I think, uh, you know, everybody here is aware of the predicament of mankind today and uh, also aware that our health and prosperity depends uh, ultimately on scientific discoveries. And with that background of knowledge, it's natural to be tempted, certainly I find people in the street are tempted to look for some way of having only good science, directing science uh, along benign paths, in other words. And some actually look to the scientific community to achieve this through some code of restraint. Well, I think we can, in other contexts, demand more responsibility of scientists, and I might just say in passing that I'm involved with some friends in trying to float a uh, a scheme, it's called a fund for science and society, which will, uh, everything begins by collecting a million dollars, so we shall start by trying to collect a million dollars, and the objective is to use the interest from this sum to have <coughs> fellowships that uh, take people out of their laboratories for a period of a few months so that they make a full-time study in that period of some uh, area could be in the area of arms, it could be in the area of development, could be in the area of environment, where their uh, technological background has made them aware of uh, a major societal problem, and they want to bring themselves to the level of expertise where instead of sitting in audiences, they can stand on platforms. And uh, so, uh, that's the, the Fund for Science and Society, which I've just been spending some time on. It's just being born. So yes, I think there are things that scientists uh, should be doing that they are not. But I would not include the uh, uh, direction of science along purely benign paths as one of those, because I don't regard that as a real option. And I'm now going to explain why not. It isn't totally obvious. How might one try to control science, to get only good science. So let's think about it. One real option, seldom proposed and I suppose never deliberately exercised, would be to slow down science deliberately or halt it if you want. It's a real option in the sense that it could be done. However, the point I want to make to you is that, uh, in my view anyway, it's a pitiful sort of response to our predicament. To turn away from science would be to abandon the most powerful mode of thinking open to us in this century and, and well into the next, surely. On the grounds that we human beings are so little to be trusted as a species that, are best, uh, that we're best kept in ignorance of nature's laws. Somebody who did uh, elaborate that view 
but tongue-in-cheek, he didn't believe it, was H.G. Wells in a book published at the turn of the century, 1911 actually, I think it was. It was called, and is called, The Country of the Blind. And what it describes, satirically, is a society in which sight was regarded as being a dangerous condition, best cured by prompt surgery. Um, now, Wells, in fact, uh, was a prophet of the scientific age in a naive way which we today would be hesitant to embrace. But anyway, his, so his book uh, was intended to shock his readers into renouncing any but the path of scientific clear-sightedness, which is how he would have expressed it. Now, he went uh, perhaps a bit far, but most of us, uh, I certainly would agree with Wells that human dignity is ill-served by a blindfold. There has to be a surer and more worthy uh, path ahead than intellectual castration. Well, the fallback period that, uh, I mean, position that people have, because few people, of course, take that scenario seriously, fallback position is uh, to say, let's apply restraints specifically to those areas of uh, science that appear likely to give rise to applications which we haven't yet had time to consider. But I'm going to uh, suggest to you that on closer examination, that proposal uh, is either going to be ineffective, or if you make it effective, it's going to be indistinguishable from the one that I just chucked out. The idea then, to repeat myself, is to, instead of restraining the criminal science, uh, uh, to combat his uh, destructive tendencies, let's restrain uh, uh, his trigger finger that pulls the trigger of the scientific gun. What's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong is that the expanding domain of science is more an amoeba in its uh, configuration than it's like a man with a finger. It has an outline which is changing all the time. If you cut off the trigger finger, you'll be confronted with two others that achieve the same objective. And I can be more specific, and it's worth being more specific. Uh, in an age, uh, and that's what's peculiar about our age, an age that sanctions mass destruction, the, the killing of people as if they were insects, uh, we rightly fear that we will be among the masses destroyed. If then, in the hope of uh, preventing that disaster, we amputate the nuclear trigger finger, then in the absence of a major change of heart in society, then what we will see is that the chemical trigger finger, the chemical weapons one, or the biological trigger finger, or the radiological one, the weapons based on fallout, or the directed energy trigger finger, that's the laser one, um, will grow twice as fast because society has the same objectives and there's the whole remaining panorama of science to be exploited. Um, underlying the nightmare that I've just described is the fact that it's not really the patient who we're operating on trying to cut off his trigger finger that is the criminal. It's the surgeon, society, that is the criminal. Uh, really, all I'm doing is telling you in different words a truism, and a truism is something that's true, but you've heard it all before, uh, a truism that scientific knowledge per se of itself doesn't threaten anyone, but the uses do, and it's there that we have to intervene. So we're going to have to uh, have a diminution in the international clamor and competition for higher levels of armament, and we see such a diminution now uh, when Reagan and Gorbachev meet and so forth. Uh, without that, there's no way we can operate on the scientific uh, body and uh, ameliorate our da the dangers that threaten us. And uh, I, I think uh, I, I don't have to uh, 
dwell on that point anymore. But uh, I don't think that I've convinced all the people uh, of this point. There will be some who, understandably, still look to scientists to rescue us from the consequences uh, of science unilaterally by calling a halt to science or, or some parts of it. And in fact, in the aftermath of a, a nuclear holocaust, you can be sure there will be many who take this view. There'll be a natural inclination to wreak vengeance on the scientific messengers who brought the news that E is equal to MC squared. The point I'm trying to make is that that wasn't bad news at the time, any more than was the news that force is equal to mass times acceleration. So long as society uh, has the ambitions that, uh, that I've been deploring, it's improper, in my view, for it, a society hell-bent on destruction, including self-destruction, to demand of a minority within that society that they save the majority from themselves, save them by forcing the majority to take the path of righteousness. In fact, uh, were scientists to organize themselves to take over the levers of power, to coerce the rest of society, they would be taking it as axiomatic that their judgment as scientists uh, is better than that of the much larger group of non-scientists. And if scientists as a group were to behave in that fashion, they would, quite rightly, be severely disciplined. One section of society can't arrogate to itself the right to subvert the normal processes by which political decisions are made. Nor can the majority blame a minority for failure to practice subversion. Um, this, uh, it's important to get these points right before one then goes on to say what uh, one does hope for and expect from the scientific community. There's, there's a, a loophole here which maybe is in your minds, it should be, and that has to do with individual acts of uh, withdrawal of services on the part of scientists, uh, acts for which I'm grateful and acts uh, in which I have sometimes uh, been involved. There's one example in which I was involved today, quite a spectacular one involving about 12,000 scientists worldwide, and that is a uh, refusal to uh, work directly on the Strategic Defense Initiative, the Star Wars uh, uh, proposal, venture, let's call it. Um, but you see, am I now contradicting myself? I'm part of that, and yet I say that scientists shouldn't try and subvert the political process, shouldn't be blamed for failure to practice subversion. Uh, well, you see, I don't see this action of mine and 11,999 others as being an attempt to uh, subvert the normal processes of uh, decision-making. Um, it's a, a gesture designed to draw attention to our uh, strongly held views. The scientists uh, who choose not to participate in STI research, as it's called, and the nations, uh, ours is one, that uh, to some degree refuse to participate in the STI venture, don't really think that their actions are going to cause it to come to a grinding halt, the, the absence of governmental participation by Canada or the absence of my help isn't going to stop the thing. But that's not the point, any more than when somebody lies down in front of a, a tank, uh, they think that the army is then going to disband. Uh, what they think is that somebody is going to notice that this chap must feel rather strongly if he lies down in front of that tank. Um, so it's a gesture, it's not a suggestion for the way in which we are going to save ourselves and arrange our affairs. 
Uh, this particular initiative, I don't want to dwell on it, you can uh, raise it if you like in the discussion. Uh, I think it's doomed and it's right that it should be abandoned. And I think that scientists uh, through uh, will have played a major part in bringing about the result that over the coming years you will hear less and less about the STI, Star Wars. Uh, but they will have accomplished it in part by the gestures of, of uh, uh, you know, attention-getting gestures I mentioned, but largely by the proper process of argument and winning over of the majority, not by coercing them, still less by reshaping science so as to make the STI impossible. Well, I think I've said enough about the fact that the majority, these, these are uh, sort of I think rather obvious things, but they aren't things that are much discussed. You, I've never been to a lecture on the ethics of science, uh, and maybe it shows, but uh, there aren't any lectures <laughs> on the ethics of science, um, and uh, there should be. Well, I've said often enough that the majority can't blame a minority, i.e. the scientists, for failing to force it, the majority, to do what the minority consider is right. But what they can blame the minority, the scientists and engineers for, and should, is failure to participate to the full extent of their talents and their education in the political process. And uh, that's certainly a uh, central responsibility of the scientist to the society which has given him the privilege of a high level of education and, as if that weren't enough, also a measure of respect. Uh, with any invocation to action, there should be a warning, and there is, and that is that when a scientist participates in uh, that sort of political debate, he should be careful not to uh, traffic in his reputation as a specialist in some sort of arcane uh, area, which almost certainly is irrelevant to the topic or to most of the issues in the topic under debate. What he's really bringing to the discussion isn't the authority of his expertise, but other valuable qualities, uh, indispensable qualities. That's why he's got to get involved. Uh, and they are an acquaintance with the world of science. What is possible in science? What isn't possible? What do scientists do? What does it mean to make a discovery? How certain is anybody of anything? Uh, these are things that one learns painfully over a period of decades. I mean, apart from the fact that you're familiar with arithmetic, which uh, some people aren't. And, uh, and then, above all, the fact that uh, you have a, a well-sharpened skepticism about people who are presented as being experts, because you've heard yourself presented as being expert and you know how little it means. <laughs> well, once a scientist uh, joins in public debate, he shouldn't be naive. He should realize that he's venturing on uh, an area where he is open to uh, being uh, attacked and, and should expect to be attacked. He's going to uh, experience forces which are new to him. His motives, for one thing, will be impugned, uh, and his judgment will be questioned. All sorts of things like that. And he shouldn't be deterred by that. Um, you can blame him if he is. Well, on the whole, uh, I, I would say, and I think it's evident from uh, what I told you about my involvement right now in trying to float a uh, program of studies in science and society that would leave people as scientists but would get them to crawl out from under their stones for a few months and uh, uh, educate themselves uh, rather thoroughly in the current state of some technological societal debate. Uh, you can gather from that that I don't think scientists have done enough. And I, I guess it's worth asking why not. And uh, as usual, the reasons for not doing enough are both uh, flattering and unflattering. 
Um, I mean, one reason is that we've been afraid of bringing science in disrepute by uh, pretending to be experts in more than we are experts in. But we can't afford to uh, have the luxury of a uh, monastic life. You have to take those chances. I mean, you can try to, uh, try to make it clear that you are not talking as an expert, you're talking as somebody who's scientifically literate and who's uh, fallible. But by gosh, you have to get involved in the debate and try and improve it. The world is too dangerous a place to allow us any longer, much as we'd like it, the privilege of, of single-minded and exclusive devotion to our craft. And, uh, well, there have always been uh, some scientists who realized that, and uh, we should take pride in, in the fact that they existed, and uh, one uh, moment when that became uh, very evident was uh, at the dawn of the atomic age. Uh, and uh, there are various, uh, I'm just wondering what uh, aspect of that history to remind you of. There's one moment where, at the uh, testing of the first uh, atomic bomb when uh, Oppenheimer said, the scientists have known sin, which was a very puzzling statement. And some thought that he was lamenting the fact that he had been involved in the Manhattan Project. I don't think that was the case. Uh, what he really meant was that from now on, uh, scientists were going to have to be part of the broad range of political debate, that they couldn't isolate themselves from it that they were going to have to be involved in those tragic compromises which form the substance of ethics that I referred to in opening this talk. And if you want uh, to have that brought home to you even more forcefully, think of the time in 1939 when uh, Einstein, uh, the greatest scientist of our age and a pacifist, uh, found himself feeling that he had to make the ethical compromise of writing the letter to President Roosevelt, which then set in motion the effort to build the most destructive and appalling weapon in human history. So uh, that's the real world, and we are part of it. But. Uh, do we have something to contribute? Uh, I'll just read to you a paragraph or so from a document which was written by a group of scientists. Uh, it was emerged from a little seminar in Chicago in 1944, a seminar, or early 45, before the first atomic bomb test. The seminar was chaired by James Frank, a Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize winner, and they were discussing what the atomic bomb, when it appeared, would do to uh, the relations between states. And uh, they wrote a very prescient document, which four and a half decades later, or whatever it is, uh, is still very apropos. Uh, it started, the scientists on this project, meaning the Manhattan Project, do not presume to speak authoritatively on problems of national and international policy. Uh, but we find ourselves uh, inescapably forced to participate in the debate, which then was a very secret debate and a very difficult one, therefore, to press forward because people had to meet in tiny groups and couldn't consult with each other. But then they went on, and I quote, in the past, science has often been able to provide new methods of protection against new weapons of aggression. But it cannot promise protection against the destructive use of nuclear power. Uh, this protection can only come from the political organization, by which they meant reorganization, of the world. Among all the arguments calling for an, for an efficient international organization for peace, the existence of nuclear weapons is the most compelling one. 
Remember, the United Nations hadn't been founded then, the atom bomb hadn't been tested, the UN hadn't been founded, and we hadn't been through four and a half decades of having our noses rubbed in the uh, uh, appalling specter of this weapon. And uh, really, to bring things up to date, was it yesterday or the day before that uh, the uh, <coughs> President of the United States uh, went to the UN and uh, made his peace with that body and said that the future really hinges on uh, support of the UN, a body which previously the Soviet Union had been uh, neglecting, failing to pay its dues, trampling on, and the Soviet Union in the Gorbachev period has been enthusiastic about the UN, and uh, if it were to disappear, we'd have to get busy and invent it immediately. Well, so uh, I don't think I need go on with that quotation. I, I think that there are, well, maybe a sentence or two more, and uh, that will finish it. Uh, they, he to they talked about the achievement of an agreement um, which uh, would restrain the arms race from taking over and uh, could block the use of these weapons and said that the uh, general desire for such an agreement, if there is any rationality, has to be conceded following the atomic bomb and uh, the only obstacle is the readiness, and now I'm quoting again, to sacrifice the necessary fraction of one's own sovereignty by all the parties. So that was uh, scientists talking very much in the wilderness uh, a little under half a century ago. And as I say, there are heartening signs today that we're beginning to learn this lesson. World leaders and uh, their citizens, of course, who really are usually ahead of the world leaders, are becoming convinced that survival is impossible except in the context of a new regime of international restraint. And of course that implies the surrender of some of the historical prerogatives of the mighty. And uh, it's not a fantasy to suppose that established modes of thought can be changed. Men and women, and hence their governments, are capable of learning. And science, in fact, is the greatest adventure in learning that contemporary history has to offer. In the space, uh, if you think about science, in the space of the last one or two generations, the field of science has been turned on its head several times. Scientific orthodoxy has been threatened by intellectual revolutions and then has proceeded to embrace them, and science has been stronger than ever. And that is the sort of thing that's going to happen outside the, and has to happen outside the domain, domain of science. Because the, the future of our species hinges on revolutionary change in our concept, first of all, of the role of force in human affairs. But it's not only the role of force, it's uh, also a rethinking of the whole terms of our tenancy uh, of this globe. Uh, given the limits to our resources and to growth. And that's resulted in appeals for conservation and uh, with the uh, understanding of uh, scarcity, uh, a new feeling for the need for an equitable sharing of wealth. We've only seen the beginning of that movement. Scientists, uh, as citizens and as members of an international community, have an important part in, uh, uh, to play in espousing imaginative solutions to these problems which, uh, you know, in a substantive way I haven't been able to talk about, the problem of arms, the problem of the environment, the problem of development. And if, sil if scientists are silent, if they fail to play their part, then they deserve our blame. But happily, I think in increasing numbers, they are accepting 
their responsibility. So thank you for your attention.